America did not exist. Four centuries of work, bloodshed, loneliness, and fear created this land. We built America, and the process made us Americans. Walt Disney held many titles throughout his lifetime: a storyteller, a showman, a pioneer. But the one he would probably most readily admit was a patriot. This love for his country began at a young age, when at 16 he forged the birth year on his passport in order to enlist with the Red Cross Ambulance Corps in World War I. From the studio's contributions to the war efforts, to the live-action television serials of Davy Crockett and the Swamp Fox, Walt's steadfast patriotism remained one of his most enduring characteristics over the course of his extensive career. These patriotic values culminated with his crowning achievement of Disneyland. Founded, as he put it, on the ideals, the dreams, and the hard facts that created America, Disneyland served as the embodiment of Walt's idealized view of his country, with Main Street, Frontierland, and even Tomorrowland all celebrating the romanticized potential of the American dream. While the 1964 World's Fair led to perhaps the most famous display of Walt's patriotism, his never-built projects also had significant influence on his company's future endeavors. This tiny cul-de-sac is Liberty Street. Envisioned as Disney's interpretation of Colonial Williamsburg, its Revolutionary War setting transported guests back to the birth of our nation, as seen in its two major attractions. The first of which could be found in the Hall of Presidents, and would have featured a show titled One Nation Under God, with wax figures depicting every president from Washington to Eisenhower. The other, dubbed the Hall of Declaration of Independence. Would have showcased life-size animated tableaus detailing distinctive moments of Revolutionary history, as narrated by Benjamin Franklin. So, if you'll pardon a young man's pride, for me, this is the beginning of the American adventure. Despite Walt's desire to make Liberty Street a reality, it would take another two decades for his dream to finally be realized. First and most obviously in the Magic Kingdom's Liberty Square and its Hall of Presidents, and later within the remnants of his experimental prototype community of Tomorrow. Far from welcoming the Imagineers, the ideas left behind in the wake of Walt's passing severely challenged them. Finally, through those early mists of uncertainty. Emerged Epcot Center as we know it today, a permanent World's Fair comprised of two distinctive halves. The first was Future World, which appropriately showcased the wonders of modern technology as seen through the lens of nine pavilions. The latter was the World Showcase, where varying countries hosted pavilions celebrating their diverse histories and cultures. And serving as the transitional bridge between the two, stood the host pavilion for America. Initially perceived as a massive circular structure on stilts, a design oddly reminiscent to the recently proposed Festival Center, the pavilion was meant to contain an elaborate attraction celebrating the history of America. But Imagineers were conflicted on just what type of experience it should be. Mark Davis proposed a humorous musical journey through American folk tales, and even went so far as to have the grim-grinning composer himself, Buddy Baker. Draft a scratch track of the Dark Rides theme song. While this idea may have sounded promising in theory, Davis was the mastermind behind Disneyland's beloved America Sings, after all. Supposedly, Wed Enterprises executive vice president Marty Scalar and the rest of the Florida team strongly disliked his whimsical take on America. Instead of a dark ride, Scalar suggested that perhaps the attraction would be better suited as a massive multimedia theatrical production. Several versions of Scalar's concepts were drafted by such contributors as author Ray Bradbury, who also consulted on the script for Spaceship Earth, and producer James Algar, who had written the original scripts for both Great Moments with Mr. Lincoln and the Hall of Presidents. 
Yet none of them could satisfactorily summarize the unwieldy three centuries of American history. With Epcot's opening only a few years away, it wasn't until Randy Bright joined the project that the American adventure of today began to take shape. Bright first began his career at Disney in the summer of 1959, where he joined the crew of Disneyland's sailing ship Columbia. From there, he continued to work throughout the park in a myriad of roles, ranging from Jungle Cruise skipper to Tomorrowland astronaut. In 1968, Marty Scalar personally invited Bright to Imagineering as a staff writer. By 79, Bright had risen to become the executive producer of theatrical development for Disney Parks, specifically the upcoming Epcot Center. With Bright now at the helm, the American adventure entered a new frontier. The entire pavilion was moved from World Showcase's entrance to the opposite end of the lagoon, as it was felt that the host pavilion should be amongst its fellow nations, not overshadowing them. The building's design was also heavily modified as to circumvent the potential negative connotations of guests literally having to walk beneath America. Unlike the Magic Kingdom's Hall of Presidents, the design team purposely avoided recreating any existing government building, instead settling on a more welcoming Georgian manor. I insisted on real materials, real brick, real slate on the roof, copper, and I even insisted on a real marble floor in the main hall. But a successful project involves compromises, so I compromised on several items, but only where the imitation material would not detract from the excellence we were trying to achieve. I didn't compromise on the brick, however. There are 110,000 of these hand-formed bricks on the three sides of the building that is exposed to the public. Imagineering even employed their first major use of reversed force perspective making the large five-story structure appear to be a less imposing three stories. To help develop the main attraction storyline, Bright scoured the previously rejected story treatments, including one of his own, in search of components that could be implemented into the new show. The show as it's being constructed and produced right now is the result of six other failures, including one by myself. And each failure led to development of another kind of approach toward telling something significant and substantial about America. One of these reoccurring ideas was letting the history of America be told by those who lived it, primarily through the use of three hosts, one to represent each century, starting with Benjamin Franklin. We chose Ben Franklin because we didn't think anybody could be a more lucid spokesperson for the revolutionary war period of time than the great father of everything from wit to invention to articulation of the American experience. We thought we could bring humor into this. I mean, Ben Franklin had it all wrapped up. Mark Twain was chosen next, as not only did the team feel that his wry sense of humor served as a good foil to Franklin's optimism, his inclusion felt particularly apt having been one of Walt Disney's personal heroes. However, it proved to be quite a bit more challenging to determine who should represent the 20th century. The closer we got to today, the more controversial things become. Everybody had their idea who that person should be. And we probably went through 300 names, not one of which could you get five people around a table to agree on as the spokesperson for the 20th century. We're just too close to that period of time. Now, if you got in a, a time capsule and you flashed forward to the... Uh, uh, but a hundred years from now, I think historians would be able to give us a figure to come back and put on that statue. One such suggestion was Walter Cronkite. And even though he ultimately wasn't selected, he would later serve as narrator for Spaceship Earth. The team eventually elected Will Rogers as the final host, though they had perhaps overestimated the lasting impact Willomania had on society. Well, we took that idea to a college class back east to, I think, about 150 students of political science, about five of whom knew who Will Rogers was. So the show's trio became a duo, and Rogers was relegated to just a cameo appearance. As for the story itself, rather than trying to pack in as much American history as possible, Bright opted to focus on a central theme and extract key moments from history that best illustrated the show's message. Well, we tried to instill each scene down to its sort of its elemental form, to capture the essence of what that scene was really trying to say about America, whether it was illustrating the human suffering and perseverance during the Great Depression, 
or even depicting the struggle and conflict involved in the creation of the Declaration of Independence. And I might also add that nothing included in this show was taken lightly because we put as much authenticity as we possibly could right into the production itself. To assist with the authenticity of the project, Bright contacted UCLA professor of history, Dr. Alan Yarnell. Randy had come up with the, the notion of dreamers and doers. I thought that was a solid theme. I thought that, again, most Americans can relate to that. Uh, and it's a theme that seemed to work pretty well, and we took that theme and ran all the way through from the, the uh, pre-colonial period, really, at least that was in my thinking, right through the contemporary period. Far from Walt Disney's rose-colored idealism, Yarnell and Bright insisted on including viewpoints from all of America's citizens, especially those who found out that we the people did not necessarily mean all the people. One of the concepts though, that we tried to stay with was the overcoming of adversity. Uh, that, that became a parameter too. Uh, another concept we tried to stay with was we didn't want to whitewash the American adventure. There were blemishes, like slavery, certain injustices. We felt we wanted to show those, demonstrate they were there, but at the same time, we didn't want to be heavy hitting we realized these were people, again, not in for a history lesson, but on vacation. So I think what it says is that the American adventure is and probably will always be a struggle. And we're going through a hell of a struggle right now in this country. And if you look at it, without that frame of reference that things have been tough in the past, stop crying about what's happening right now, then you realize that if you apply, apply yourself, you can move forward. That's the positive note that's there. This focus on the fortitude and perseverance of the American people heralded a new dawn for Bright's American adventure. Though even he admitted there was one final failure his show had to endure. I think one of the toughest things we had to do was try to take 350 years and compress it down to 20 minutes. In fact, we failed. It's a 28 minute show. With the story finally in place, Bright and his team now faced an even tougher task bringing to life the most ambitious stage presentation Imagineering had ever produced. By early 1980, Bright had his hands full overseeing several other major Epcot projects in addition to the American Adventure. To compensate for the increased workflow, Bright asked WED newcomer Rick Rothschild to assist him on the America Project. While only joining WED a year prior, Rothschild had quickly made a name for himself, a trend that continued when just later that same year he was chosen to become the official show director for the American Adventure. Marty Scalar pointed out that since the Imagineers were used to following art directors, and Rothschild wasn't one, there may be some confusion amongst the team. So he named Rothschild WDI's very first show producer. As producer, Rothschild served as the creative conduit between Bright and the rest of the crew, ensuring that they received the necessary attention while properly executing out Bright's vision. You know, all of the technical aspects of our facility, from the lifts to uh, the special effects equipment to the projection system, all of these are, are fantastic and, and are extremely impressive. Yet, they're all there and all combined to produce one end result, and that is to tell the story of the American adventure. And to tell that story, probably the most potent device that we have is the animated figure, the animated figures that make up the cast of the American adventure. The American adventure's extensive cast was comprised of 36 individual animatronics and showcased the latest in audio animatronic technology including the very first animatronics to smoke a cigar, twirl a lasso, and climb a flight of stairs. Now ben has 52 different moves inside of him, and he's an extremely complicated figure. In fact, um, he walks up some stairs across the stage with a cane, and uh, one little mistake and uh, something drastic can happen. For example, I broke his cane four times just trying to get him to do this. To learn how to do Ben, I had to get a cane and walk around with it for almost a week. I practiced the walk, deciding how I wanted him to look. 
I had to go over it hundreds of times, acting out and working on it, until finally I got it just right. It took over a month to get it right, to make all the movements precise, and at the same time, smooth and fluid. Also, his cohort, uh, Thomas Jefferson, uh, is an extremely complicated figure. He now sits at a desk, and uh, one day I made a little mistake with him, in fact, where he actually put his hand underneath the table, and by the mistake, he actually picked up his table and threw it across the room and demolished it. Now, all these figures travel on two um, wagons, you can say. Now, these wagons are extremely heavy, thousands of pounds, and they hold all of the figures, all the electronics, hydraulic and pneumatic cylinders, the whole equipment, or ball of wax, you could say. And these figures have to be moved into position exactly and precisely to the point where they come up and hit their cue every time. And if they make one mistake, well, they'll end up coming up right through the floor and uh, breaking their head. The 65 by 35 foot war wagons, as they were affectionately called by the design team, begin each performance under the audience and slowly and silently move forwards to allow each character to appear in seamless succession. Far more complicated than making 13 clocks chime at the same time, the show was nothing short of a mechanical marvel. The American Adventure represents a number of firsts for us. This is really the first play that we've produced in the theme parks, and it is certainly the first play ever produced that stars audio-animatronic figures. We have a projection screen behind the uh, various animated figures and set pieces that come up during the show into view that is a 72 foot wide picture and that 72 foot wide picture plays for the majority of the show and then finally widens to 150 feet of a continuous projection surface uh, that is probably the largest uh, projection screen that's ever been constructed in the world. The design team also found opportunities to combine the tremendous ingenuity of WED's newer technology with the tried and true practices of some of Disney's oldest, namely the multiplane camera. What we have done with the use of three-dimensional scenery and the creative use of the multiplane film technique has never been done before. It is a film show that three-dimensional images keep falling out of. The set pieces are interlocked, synchronized with the movement of the camera on the projected background, and the whole thing works in perfect unison. It actually seems as if you were looking at a movie and craning right down into the scene when suddenly the set is right before you and all of that three-dimensionality has just literally leaped off the screen and onto the stage. Lining the walls of the 1,024-seat auditorium are statues representing the 12 spirits of America. Like the show's animatronics, these were also designed by Disney legend Blaine Gibson and his team of sculptors. The appearance of each spirit was based on reference photos taken by Gibson of various Imagineers and PICO members, including WED's first female project manager, Jane Jackson, and legendary muralist Frank Armitage, whose mountain man visage was also used for one of the pioneer paintings seen in the presentation. The designers also had a general rule to only use the mediums that naturally existed during each time period, allowing the show to evolve from still paintings, to photography, and finally to film. All of the paintings featured throughout the production were created in-house, with the Imagineers emulating famous works of art rather than simply recreating them. Though this didn't stop several artists from hiding a few familiar faces like Scholar and Bright in the crowd of the Revolutionary War Victory Parade. Nearly all of the photography used throughout the presentation came directly from museum archives, particularly the Civil War portraits that were actually taken by Matthew Brady himself. When specific media could not be located or simply did not exist, the team took great pains to recreate it themselves as was the case for the Civil War family. Imagineers Jeff Burke and John Olson portrayed the Union and Confederate brothers, respectively. The few images that required their specific characters were taken on both the Disney Studio backlot and at Disneyland. And while it's well known that the funeral scene was staged at New Orleans Square's train depot, the name of Muller's Landing was purposely chosen from a list of real Civil War-era towns that no longer existed. Rothschild also applied the same level of authenticity to the casting process and vocal performances. Given the show's extensive timeline, there were very few audio recordings that the Imagineers could reference. 
So everything from newspaper archives to private journals were used to determine the speaking patterns of the characters. In particular, Benjamin Franklin and Mark Twain. Longtime Disney voice actor Dallas McKennon was cast as Franklin back when Bright first pitched the concept. Although he may be more well known as Zeke in The Country Bears and the old prospector on Big Thunder Mountain Railroad, if any of you folks are wearing hats or glasses, best remove them, because this here's the wildest ride in the wilderness! McKennon bestowed Franklin with his trademark wit and wisdom. Prolific character actor John Anderson voiced both Mark Twain and Franklin D. Roosevelt. Having previously portrayed FDR in the 1979 miniseries, Backstairs at the White House. And please, I beg of you, this steady diet of sweet breads is making me very unsweet, causing me to bite two diplomats. Not ours, theirs. Susan B. Anthony's voice actress, Trisha Batrill, recorded her lines in a single afternoon and based her fiery performance off of Katherine Hepburn. And in that same scene, Imagineer Joe Rohde makes a vocal cameo as Alexander Graham Bell. It is an age for grand ideas. An era for innovation. A dawn for new awareness. A time to challenge the frontiers of a new century. While not having nearly as large a role as originally intended, Will Rogers still appears in the Great Depression segment and was voiced by none other than his real-life son, Will Rogers Jr. Voice acting legends Frank Welker, B.J. Ward, and Bob Holt rounded out the impressive cast. Finally came the music. We knew we wanted some specific songs in addition to the background score for certain scenes in the show. So we went on a little search. We wound up with some old tunes and we wrote some new tunes as well. Buddy Baker had remained on the project since Mark Davis's original plans, and in addition to scoring the entire show, also served as its musical director. Together with Randy Bright, he selected which songs from America's past would best suit the story, and even composed the opening number New World Bound himself, with Exitensio and Bright writing the lyrics. Starting as an upbeat sea shanty, the tune develops a more stoic tone as the pilgrims face the hardships of their new home, establishing Bright's theme of overcoming adversity. For this wilderness brings me to dread that the first bitter winter may leave all more dead. This motif returns during the centennial celebration scene and the subsequent progress montage echoing the continued tenacity of the American people. Spy on you, sir! Spy! Kermit! Go away! Go away! Wait! Kermit! Are you sure that the Continental Congress was really like this? Uh, well, actually, yes. The history books tell us it was a lot like this. But where will it all end? Well, in their case, it ended with the Declaration of Independence and the founding of the United States of America. And in our case? What else? Song cue! The traditional march in the days of 76 underscores the Revolutionary War portion of the show, with additional lyrics again provided by Bright. The emotional crux of the story comes during the Civil War, and its aptly titled ballad, Two Brothers. Originally written by Irving Gordon in 1951, who later that same year would write the Nat King Cole classic Unforgettable, it first rose to prominence thanks to K-Star's moving performance. The song has since been covered by the likes of Dusty Springfield,
Tom Jones. One wall blue and one wall gray as they marched along the way. Harry Belafonte. A fife and drum began to play. And John Denver. All on a beautiful morning. Baker initially wanted a male vocalist, but project manager Jane Jackson suggested a female perspective instead, and thought her roommate Ali Olmo would be the perfect person to help prove her point. Olmo was a self-taught guitarist who got her start playing at Disney World hotels while attending college. After moving to Los Angeles, she recorded the demo track at Jackson's request. Baker was so pleased with Olmo's performance that not only did he agree with Jackson's suggestion for a female vocalist, he hired Olmo on the spot. Olmo's interpretation remains arguably the most famous rendition of Irving's song, as seen in this rare live performance by Olmo and Tammy Tucky. Two brothers on their way Two brothers on their way Two brothers on their way One wore blue and one wore gray One wore blue and one wore gray As they marched along the way drum began to play all on a beautiful morning. While Olmo's original dreams of becoming a Disney animator were ultimately not meant to be, she continues to have an illustrious musical career, including co-writing the theme song for Lilo and Stitch, the series. Neil Diamond's Coming to America was initially proposed for the attraction's finale, but this idea was dropped sometime in the early stages of the design process. Instead, Bright enlisted the help of songwriter Bob Moline, whom he was already working alongside on the Universe of Energy. Moline's stirring anthem captures the gravitas and poignancy of the presentation, but it's Bright's lyrics that give Golden Dream its spirit. Mr. Mr. lead singer Richard Page and session singer Marty McCall provided the original 1982 vocals. To ensure the best audience experience possible, the Imagineers utilize the most advanced audio technology at their disposal. My responsibility on the American Adventure was audio engineer. By that, I took the sounds, the, the music that we recorded in Philadelphia, uh, took the effects that were recorded by one of our sound effects people here, and then we recorded the narration in the studio, and then over a process of 18 months, we just combined all that together until we came up with a finished show. The American Adventure is basically a first generation off a compact disc quality type tape, which means that the audience will hear a much clearer sound. Digital audio gives me the opportunity to mix in a wide variety of sounds, and sometimes I don't have to worry about the levels because of the dynamic range that the tape has. So let's say, let's put in some thunder for the Chief Joseph scene. And then maybe I say, well, the Revolutionary War scene needs a little more wind. And maybe George Washington's horse isn't too happy, so he's going to make a noise. <laughs> and then I have everything covered. With Epcot's opening rapidly approaching, the completed show ran for the first time with just a few weeks to spare. Six long years and countless man hours had led to this moment. And according to those in attendance, Bright was so moved by the performance that he began to cry at its conclusion. They were finally ready to share his American adventure with the world. The American Adventure opened with the rest of Epcot Center on October 1st, 1982 and was officially dedicated 10 days later. Due to the extravagant nature of the attraction, the pavilion featured two sponsors, Coca-Cola and American Express. Even though their contracts would expire in 1998 and 2002 respectively, remnants of their sponsorships still remain to this day, like Coca-Cola's prominent advertisement still seen on the gas station. 
Not only was the American Adventure an immediate hit with Epcot's audiences, it proved to be so successful that just two years after it opened, both Two Brothers and Golden Dreams were added to Disneyland's Great Moments with Mr. Lincoln, where they remain to this day. Sadly, Bright tragically passed away in 1990. The following year, a window on Main Street was dedicated in his honor, and in 2005 he was posthumously recognized as a Disney legend. After nearly a decade, the attraction received its first major update. Rick Rothschild, who had since gone on to work on such projects as Star Tours and Pleasure Island, and even cameos in the Haunted Mansion's attic, returned to oversee the renovation. In Bright's absence, Adventurer's Club composer Lynn Hart was brought on to write additional lyrics for the newly extended Golden Dreams montage. Richard Page returned to record the updated song and was now joined by R&B singer-songwriter Saida Garrett. This update also saw all animatronic figures upgraded to the latest A100 models. We've, we've taken a figure like Will Rogers and uh, given him the ability to uh, tip his hat back as he uh, was known to do. A number of his mannerisms, the speed with which he can move now uh, as a figure really captures a great deal more of, of, of the personality that Will Rogers really had. A second update to the finale montage came in 2007, adding more relevant historical figures and scenes, with the most notable addition being the inclusion of footage from 9-11. The third, and as of now latest update, came in 2018, with a complete digital remastering of the film and an entirely rescored arrangement of Golden Dreams by Harvey Mason Jr. It's been an absolute joy to collaborate with an artist like Harvey. Well, my approach was to be respectful of the original, and then I also tried to make it contemporary and somewhat relevant to what's going on in music today. After going on a journey of excitement, some down moments, some sadness, some introspection, I wanted people to leave on a high note of, man, this is great, I love America. To hear the new version go down was amazing. It's a beautiful performance by the orchestra. Many moments in the film, it swells to this incredible, like almost stand up, you know, beautiful emotion that only a rich chorus can bring. An estimated 130,000 performances later, the American Adventure remains virtually unchanged since its premiere, a testament to Brandy Bright's visionary leadership and his team's dedication to crafting both a timely and timeless perspective of America. The events that are low always lead to events that are high at that point in time, so people shouldn't wallow and self-pity about any challenges facing them today. And that's, that's the underlying score of what we're trying to say. It's happened for the fourth century American experience. And perhaps that's why the show continues to withstand the rigors of time. While its creation came 16 years after Walt's passing, many recognize the attraction as a true continuation of his legacy, including his daughter Diane. Standing in the American Adventure and that wonderful uh, vocal group singing there, all of a sudden I got this image of Dad and he was very a great sentimentalist, you know, he uh, would st watch the flag lowering at Disneyland every evening they were down there and tears would go down his cheeks, right? Oh, yeah. And I could say I had an image of him standing there listening to this group with tears coming down his cheeks. I mean, I know he would have been there doing that. However, when speaking on the attraction's future, Rick Rothschild did sound this warning. With each passing year, newer generations will connect less and less with the show. As it stands, the same amount of time has transpired from the show's final physical scene and Epcot's opening as the park's opening to today. Not to mention how different the America of today is from the one of 1982. I think the show's creators never dreamed of an America like this. And while major modifications to the show are inevitable, the foundation laid by Bright allows future Imagineers to continue to fulfill the promise and meaning of his American adventure a message that is best illustrated by Benjamin Franklin's closing reflection. To everyone a chance, believe Thomas Wolfe, to all people, regardless of their birth, the right to live, to work, to be themselves, and to become whatever their visions can combine to make them. This is the promise of America. 
Mr. Twain, it is easy to see, hard to foresee, but I foresee the American adventure to continue a long, long time. America, Thanks for watching, everyone. I want to recognize the Tomorrow City and Progress City podcasts, and especially Tammy Tucky's Tiara Talk Show, all of which were instrumental in the research for this episode. They feature excellent interviews with the cast and creatives of the American Adventure with tons of details I wasn't able to fit in. So I'll put a link to each of them below so you can check them out for yourselves. This episode marks the launch of my Epcot miniseries, so for the next two months, we'll delve into the music and legacy of Epcot Center. There's also still our Patreon, which for just $1 a month, you gain access to monthly exclusive videos with topics chosen by you. Link in the description below. As always, thank you so much for watching, and if you've enjoyed this episode, please feel free to like, share, and subscribe, and I will see you all a little later. Are you nearsighted or farsighted? Both. That's why I invented the bifocal. Yeah!